And now I'd like to uh, introduce our special guest for this evening. Um, he's a man who's dedicated himself for over 40 years to the preservation of food quality through the protection of germplasm. Um, he's a Maine homesteader, the founder of the Scatter Seed Project. Um, he was, for many years, a major contributor to the Seed Savers Exchange and all the other seed catalogs that we all order things from every winter. Um, he's an author, a gifted storyteller, and the man who I hope will inspire everyone here to start saving more of their own seeds to help with the diversity of our food supply. And please welcome Will Wassel. Good evening, and it's really good to see so many of you. In, in spite of this weather, this is this is pretty good. There's a lot of people either still on the road coming here, or gave up and got smart and quit. I'm not saying that you're not smart because you didn't quit. <laughs> it's great to see. Some, and of course, of course, this is a wonderful group, and we know why so many people here. We all know that. Is seed saving is basically all about sex, and and humans are obsessed with sex, even if it's rutabaga sex. You know? And so, let me just say right off that when. When I'm discussing things, you know, how to things, various things with, we're always dealing with the sex life of plants, and you know, I don't, I don't speak Latin, and I don't know. You know I'm not going to throw jargon at you like stamens and stigmas and sepals and that kind of stuff. I barely know what they mean. I usually use basic words like girl parts and boy parts or something. And even though the and I often use analogies to human sexuality. And sometimes it sounds kind of silly, like, well, it's sort of like a potato plant. It sort of like has an innie and an outie, and it can do it to itself and make hundreds of them, and then they, you know, whatever. And everyone gets blushes and giggles and stuff like that. But they get it. I've never had anyone fall asleep during that part of the, uh, <laughs> the thing, because we all know how we do it. So it's, the analogies are very, very uh, targeted sometimes. Well, first of all, I mean, this is probably preaching to the choir in, in a church yet. Um, but uh, I probably don't have to even, you know, give you very much emphasis on our much of a lecture on why you should save your own seeds. But I'll mention some points that you can add to your, to your own. And, of course, one of them, uh, my main reason for getting into seed saving in the first place was self-reliance. And, in fact, specifically to save money. When I first, uh, you know, moved to my homestead, got out of college and went to homesteading back in the you know, hippies, the late, early 70s, um, my main, I didn't know, I never heard of ger genetic uh, erosion. Uh, never heard the word germplasm. It sounded like a filthy word, actually. And um, all, all of this stuff about extinction of varieties and stuff, I, I wasn't aware of it. I just knew that I wanted to be self-sufficient. I had been grew up, like most of us, watching too many Davy Crockett and Daniel Boone movies, you know, and so I wanted to do the self-sufficiency thing. And to me, I went into more depth than most people about that, in that direction. I thought of not only growing my own food and storing and eating my own food, but the the adjuncts to that, the things that lead to it. For example, um, producing my own fertility on site and building the soil without bringing in a lot of rock powders and manure and things from somewhere else. Things I, I started out my working career in the mining business, actually, when I was quite young, and I got turned off on it, and I left it, and I decided to get into something more recycling, and nothing more recycling than organic, especially true organic farming. It's a closed cycle thing. And so after I was doing it for a while, I started hearing people talking about, you know, so many tons per acre of lime and phosphate and sulfomag and stuff like that. And I had to ask myself, geez, I thought I'd get out of that business. <laughs> and so, uh, so I've been searching, um, and this is a total other subject that we won't get into much tonight, how to build the soil from within, from the materials at hand, uh, from the land itself or close by land without having to bring in a bunch of stuff from somewhere else with a huge carbon footprint and all that kind of stuff. That was one aspect of it. But the other one, which is more germane to tonight, is what about all these seeds? I, I, again, I didn't know about heirloom varieties. The word wasn't widely used then. And okay, I'm going to buy the stuff from uh, Gurney's and Vessie's and da 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 da. But I don't want to go back next year and buy the same damn stuff. You know, why should I do that? Um, I didn't mind buying anything once, but I wanted to keep it going. So to do that, I had to learn a lot about seed saving, not just about tomatoes and beans. But I had to basically learn how to propagate plants of any crop that I wanted to eat. So I had to not do just beans and, and tomatoes, I had to also do kohlrabi and uh, leeks and Brussels sprouts, any of those things. You know, if I was going to have them on my plate and really be sustainable about it, I wanted to have some control of the seeds. Again, mainly because of being cheap um, and trying to be more self-reliant. Um, but about that time I started hearing about um, varieties. Well, I worked for a dairy farmer across town and uh, saw some things in his garden which kind of knocked my socks off. They were uh, he had some things that were very interesting that you could not get from any seed catalog. 
he had a kind of a, he called it a lima bean, and I did too for a long time, but I later learned it was actually a white runner bean, like scarlet runner beans, only white. Got some of those with me, I think. And um, it's like a lima bean that will mature in Maine, which is unthinkable, you know, especially a pole lima. Uh, but it t looks like, tastes like a, a lima bean. And that was way cool. And he didn't know, he got from someone many, you know, many years earlier, he didn't, if he lost it, he would know, knew of no place to get it back again. And same here. Um, he had a weird-looking potato called a cow horn. Okay, that's something mainly called cow horns, and uh, shaped kind of like a you know, and purple and kind of scraggly-looking plants. A weird-looking thing. Not as bothered by potato bugs as some of the other varieties, but just intriguing. And uh, and again, you couldn't get it off the shelf. Actually, there are now some commercial potato companies that sell it because there's a new trend for heritage varieties. But so I started learning about some of that stuff, and so I started realizing it's more than just saving money. There's also saving heritage.